now the next mantras five and six they talk about practices what is necessary for enlightenment what are the practices necessary for enlightenment let's see satyena labhya tapasahesha atma samyagyanena brahmacharyena nityam anta sharire jyotir mayo hi shubhro yang pashyanti yatayakshina dosha very beautiful mantra the bright and pure self within the body that the monks with habitual effort and attenuated blemishes see is attainable through truth concentration complete knowledge and continence practiced constantly all right what's said here spiritual practices truth austerities um knowledge chastity practiced constantly and uh, so what does it mean in vedanta there are two kinds of practices inner and outer um, antaranga bahiranga inner and outer the inner practices are directly re- related to knowledge to realization to enlightenment the inner practices are the well known most familiar to us um, hearing reasoning meditation shravana manana nididhyasana for example what we are doing now is part of the inner practices the actual teaching then you reason it out and then contemplate on the clarity so gained that's the inner practice but there are certain necessary um so called outer practices preliminaries preparations necessary practices they may not be sufficient to give you enlightenment but they are necessary without them enlightenment is not possible and the inner practices the study of vedanta will not bear fruit unless those outer practices are held on to what are they first and foremost truth integrity honesty truth shankaracharya gives two definitions one here and one in the next mantra here he says the negative definition mrisha vadana tyaga giving up false speech deceit so at the level of action at the level of speech and at the level of thought giving up all falsity deceit falsehood see morality and spirituality it is true that there is a distinction but one must never forget there is a very tight connection between the two it one cannot be spiritual without being moral um, the person who is moral may not be spiritual but w- one thing one has to notice if one sticks consistently makes a great effort to lead a righteous life that will lead to spirituality but the reverse is not true if one tries to be spiritual without being righteous without being moral ethical and then one cannot be spiritual one cannot have god without being good one can be good without being particularly interested in god although the claim is if one makes a huge effort to be good in it's always a struggle then one will become spiritual that, that is it will happen satya and the core of it all is truth what holds it all together is truth sri ramakrishna famous famously said the austerities tapasya for this age the age of kali this age our dark age material age he said there's one practice which is honesty truth truth is the one thing to hold on to there is that um, famous prayer of sri ramakrishna where he gives everything to the mother mother here is thy knowledge and thy ignorance knowledge and ignorance he says here is thy um, uh, here is thy so called purity and impurity and like this he keeps on giving um but he says he could not he could not say mother here is the truth and the falsity no he says if i give up the truth then where will i be if we are looking for the ultimate reality which is defined as sat reality itself truth itself then in our day to day life we must hold on to the truth how can we aim for the ultimate truth of the universe the ultimate reality here if we cannot hold on to truth in our conventional lives in our daily in our quotidian lives so satya satyena labhya uh, enlight is very clear here enlightenment is attained to truth then tapasa by uh, austerities there are various kinds of austerities 
you know, vigils at night, fasting, um, restricting one's diet, um, so many kinds of austerities. But here, Shankaracharya, in his commentary, he focuses on one. And he says, austerity, the highest austerity, highest tapasya, is a very broad word in Indian spiritual life, tapasya. The highest austerity, highest tapasya is concentration. It's focus. It is to pay attention. How interesting. In this day of distraction, the age of distraction, he says the greatest spiritual practice you can do is to pay attention, it is, is to focus. Let me read Shankaracharya's comment here in his commentary. Indriya mana ekagrataya tapasa. By the focus of the senses and mind. Don't let your eyes flicker around seeing this, seeing that. Don't let your ears listen to a little bit of this and a little bit of that. We have this problem of um, flickering attention these days. This, and that's due to, partly at least due to this wonderful technology we have, especially the phones and social media and all. We tend to have, um, there's a new phenomenon, it's called the phenomenon of intermittent attention. Intermittent attention. And people everywhere, in boardrooms, in classrooms, people are familiar with it. And that It's not that people in, in the job, in the boardroom, in a meeting are not paying attention. They are paying attention, but only once in a while. It's not that uh, the students in the classroom are not paying attention to the teacher. They are, but only once in a while. I've myself seen this at a place no less than Harvard University. Sometimes I would sit back in big lectures, like big lecture halls, sit at the back, and you can look down, and everybody, you can see the kids, they're studying and they're listening to the teacher, and they all have their screens open before them. Um, I somehow think this having laptops and phones in the classroom is sometimes more of a nuisance than, an, than a help, actually. Anyway, now what I noticed was interesting, that uh, these kids were pretty serious, they're pretty smart kids. But the work ethic now, or the study ethic now is, you listen to the teacher, and then you look it up on the screen, what the teacher is saying. Maybe you do a little bit of search about what the teacher is saying. And then from that search, go on to something else. It's not related to the class. And then come back again to what the teacher is saying. And that goes on throughout the one hour class, class or one and a half hour class. And this is in classrooms. This is in um, workplace everywhere. This is called the phenomenon of intermittent attention. This won't do. The most valuable commodity that we have is attention. The eminent psychologist, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who wrote the book Flow, his whole life's purpose was to search for the mental states which are um, indicative of the best, you know, the highest quality life when we are at our most fulfilled, um, what Maslow had called peak experiences or close to peak experiences. And he called these flow states. And the common characteristic of all flow states, whether it's a tennis player, that's the example he used, or it's a chess player, or it's a person studying, or it's a person uh, painting, whatever we are doing, um, or a surgeon doing surgery, the, the common denominator of all these flow states, our peak states, are uh, undivided attention. Undivided attention. Uh, when our attention is focused on a challenging and fulfilling task, all of these are important. A kid might be playing a, a, a video game with undivided attention, but that's not a flow state because it's ultimately not fulfilling. It has to be a challenging and fulfilling task, uh, an enriching task, and it should demand our entire attention. Then it's a flow state. And he said, those states are the most valuable states of our life. That's when we are at our happiest, most engaged, most fulfilled. Um, and those states have become increasingly rare and disturbed because, partly because of this, the life that we are leading nowadays, um, partly because of this technology also. Then uh, Shankaracharya quotes from the Mahabharata, Manasas Chendriyanam Cha Hiyaka Griyam Paramam Tapaha. Mahabharata says that, uh, this is a verse from Mahabharata, which says the highest spiritual practice, the highest tapasya is the 
focusing of the mind and the senses is so you focus on something cut out other distractions and hold that focus three things pay attention hold that attention and cut out everything else so and this is also there in manusmriti this verse which also says focus or concentration is the highest spiritual practice in another place shankaracharya in his book upadesha sahasri a thousand teachings there he says uh, the purpose of all spiritual austerities tapasya the purpose of all spiritual austerities is to attain this one pointed focus on spiritual matters and he explains why shankaracharya he says tadhi anukulam atma darshana abhimukha bhavat paramam sadhanam tapo net netarat um chandrayana di so he says because it that state of mind that intensely focused state of mind is most amenable is the most suitable state of mind for enlightenment talker the realization of the self i am that the most suitable state of mind is the intensely focused state of mind the calm steady uh, focused state of mind that is most congenial to the rising of enlightenment and then he says not other austerities uh, like he gives example of fasting chandrayaan is, is a kind of fasting it's increasing um, your uh, decreasing your food intake with the waning of the moon and then increasing it back to normal with the uh, reappearance of the moon so this is a kind of fasting fasting all kinds of other austerities those are secondary they're not bad the secondary the most important thing is this intensely holding on whether it's your mantra whether it's vedantic study whether it's the self inquiry whatever it is whether it is following your breath whatever it is your spiritual practice focusing on that sister nivedita says about vivekananda that we did not see him often engaging in any particular spiritual practices other than meditation but his whole life was of such an intensity of of uh, focus intensity of concentration on, on the the highest truth it, it was a, almost a fearful intensity so you, that is the highest spiritual practice you don't need anything else if you're constantly centered on god that's the highest focus then what else so focus then brahmacharyena uh, this is celibacy brahmacharya is the control of the senses in general but particularly celibacy because it is in the uh, sexual act that the mind is most tremendously disturbed nerves and the mind are most tremendously uh, exteriorized and shaken so um, chastity has been praised in all spiritual traditions everywhere and of course this depends on context so there is one kind of set of rules of chastity for monks monastics there is another kind for householders so for householders it might be respecting the the uh, the sanctity of marriage um also sri ramakrishna said to his householder devotees that after the birth of one or two children live like brother and sister so there is an importance of celibacy or chastity in spiritual life and then so these three truth this austerity consisting of of uh, attention focus holding on keeping your mind on spiritual matters and third uh, chastity these three um uh, and these three are exterior this is the righteousness the morality which is foundational for spiritual life and then he says samya gyanena by adequate or complete knowledge what does this complete knowledge mean remember it's a practice it can't mean enlightenment that is that's what we are looking for so what not what does this knowledge mean this is a footnote given by swami gambhirananda where he says by samya gyana adequate knowledge it is meant to be under, it is understood such immature but adequate knowledge of the meaning of the text which matures into the knowledge of the thing itself the mature knowledge productive of direct perception does not depend on other factors for bringing about its results 
namely the cessation of ignorance. So it is immature knowledge that alone can be combined with such disciplines as truth, etc., for the accusation of mature knowledge. All right. What it basically means is Shravana Manana Nididhyasana. This, uh, this complete knowledge, Samya Jnana, it means the knowledge that is acquired by listening to Vedanta, teaching, studying the text, then reasoning it out for yourself, and then dwelling on it. And so uh, a clarity will be attained. And that deepens into the real arising of enlightenment, the realization, I am Brahman. That, that knowledge will remove all ignorance. That does not depend on anything else. Once that clarifying, that uh, enlightenment arises, that breakthrough arises, in technical terms, it's called Brahmakara Vritti, the, the modification of the mind in the form, I am Brahman, that realization comes. The veils drop away and the clarity in it shines forth undeniably, I am that. That does not depend on any other practice. Once that arises, that will dispel ignorance and you are free. You realize that you are Brahman. But before that, there is a stage when we are cultivating this knowledge. When we are studying Vedanta, we are reasoning it out and we are getting some clarity and dwelling on that clarity and trying to make it um, effortless and natural for us. All that, that stage of knowledge, it requires the support of truth and um, concentration and uh, chastity, all of those supporting factors are absolutely necessary. Otherwise, this, this knowledge will not arise at all. That's what's meant. Then uh, the mantra says, Nityam, constantly. And Shankaracharya makes a big deal about this constantly. It says, constantly is like a lamp, which is the word constantly is like a lamp, which is placed on your doorstep. And it illumines your uh, the, uh, the outside of your room and the inside of your room too. So it illumines both ways. What it means is this word nityam, it uh, it should be connected to all the other words there. That means satyena nityam, nityena. That means constant practice of truth. You can't say I am truthful, only occasionally I tell a few lies. Then that's not the truth that's being referred to here. It's a constant attempt to hold on to the truth. Um, and that will lead to struggle and that will lead to, it requires courage and it requires us to maybe accept some sacrifice and loss. You might disappoint some people, you might incur financial or career-wise um, you know, losses or blows. It might happen. Mahatma Gandhi, remember, he was a householder. He had children, he had to earn his living. He took up these cases uh, as a lawyer and he made sure that he only, uh, he, st he stuck to the truth as a lawyer, which is very difficult to do. And so, but he made, uh, it was a principle and he was respected for that. But it's also true that he was not a particularly successful lawyer. So uh, that much, if you ask him by his uh, standards, he would consider himself very successful because he would see whether he is capable of holding on to the truth or not. If he holds on to the truth, he would think, I am successful. It's not an amount of money he makes or the cases he gets. So, satyena, nityena, that is, constantly uh, holding on to the truth. Then, focus, a constant focus on spiritual matters. Your study of Vedanta, your meditation, uh, your uh, you know, it's constantly thinking about that. Swami Suhita Anandaji, who's our vice president now, for many years he served a great monk, Swami Premeshananda, who was a disciple of Masharada and who's regarded in his lifetime as an enlightened person. So one day Suhita Anandaji, just as, an, as a test, the old Swami was lying in bed, he was ill. So this monk who was very young at that time, he, he said, uh, he was a novice. So he said, just as a test, he suddenly asked that old Swami, what are you thinking just now? Just now, what are you thinking? And the Swami immediately said, because he was lying with his eyes closed, uh, he immediately said, without any hesitation, Sarva Vyapi Sri Ramakrishna, all-pervading Sri Ramakrishna. Uh, 
And of course, uh, Suhidanji, I think he asked, if I remember correctly, he asked, how can Sri Ramakrishna, because Sri Ramakrishna, we see him in the picture, you know, this man with the beard sitting uh, in meditation posture in this, in this picture. How can this man be all pervading? And uh, the old Swami smiled and said, you'll understand in time. But see, at any time you catch this person, right now, what are you thinking about? Right now, tell me right now. And he says, I'm thinking about God. So this constant focus on that reality. You might think it's very boring or very difficult. It might be very boring or difficult for us. For them, it's not. It's where they dwell uh, effortlessly. Um, and then chastity. Uh, it is constant uh, chastity, unbroken chastity. Then what happens if one practices in this way, with this moral foundation of truth, with the austerity of constant focus and unbroken chastity, then what happens? You And you persist in your Vedantic inquiry, um, listening, reflecting, and meditating. Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasa. Then what happens? The next lines. Anta sharire jyotir mayohi shubhra yam pashyanti yatayakshina doshaha. That one, you see the... Uh, pure illumination, the radiation uh, in, in the in the within this body, uh, the light of of the self, the self which is pure consciousness. You realize that, young Pashyanti, that which is seen. Where is it seen? Shankaracharya here gives his commentary. Antar sharire sharir um, antar madhye sharirasya in the body, pundarika akash in the lotus of the heart. Jyotir Maya, luminous, luminous. Jyotir Maya, he, Rukma Varnam, a golden luminosity. Shubraha, um, white radiance, or, 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 or pure, pure radiance, actually. Shuddha, Yamatmanam. What is that? The self. It's you. It's your real nature as consciousness. See, don't say my consciousness. It's a very strange thing to say, say actually. If we think about it, I am consciousness. I am awareness. Everything else is that which is presented to awareness. If you say, my body, yes, the body is presented to awareness. My thoughts, my personality, that's presented to awareness. You are this awareness, this consciousness, but which consciousness? It is this, um, this radiance, this pure radiance, in which there is no materiality, no body, no mind. So that one, you realize, what do, you, do you see that? No, you don't see that. You realize that you are that. Who, who realizes? He says, Yataya, Yatayaha, the monks, Krina Doshaha, whose um, impurities have been reduced or uh, who have been thinned out, attenuated is the word that is used. Impurities, one is the vasanas, the accumulated desires and tendencies in our subconscious mind, they have been purified. Also, which lead to the flickering mind, the mind which races here and there, that has been calmed down. So the defects have been um, purified. Defects have been, the mind has been purified. The word for that is chitta shuddhi, purification of the mind. So these monks, their minds have been purified. Their hearts have been purified. In the Bible, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Literally that. So they have become pure of heart. Um, and he says, monks. Now usually, Vedanta is monastic quite a bit, and Shankaracharya makes it even more so. Even when the original text doesn't mention monks, he will bring in monks. But here he has it easy, because the original text does mention monks. Yataya, these monks. So the Mundaka Upanishad, one of the meanings of Mundaka is the shaven head, this one. So the Mundaka Upanishad is often associated with monks. And here you see words like this, Yataya, the monks. But what is meant here is, Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Antore tag, the inner renunciation, the one who holds on to truth, the one who is intensely focused on God or on, on self-realization, and the one who is chaste, that one, Sri Ramakrishna would say, is a monk internally. Externally, maybe a householder, maybe in the midst of, um, of society, holding a job, um, doing stuff, having a family. But internally, 
in Bengali, bhetore shadu, that is a, a monk internally. And Sri Ramakrishna would say for those who are formerly monks, there would be internal renunciation and external renunciation. But one thing that is not compromised with is this internal renunciation. That's, a, that's absolutely essential. The monk who has renounced externally but not internally is in a disastrous situation. There is a saying among um, people in the north of India. It translates into, you have colored your cloth without coloring your mind. You know, colored your cloth. This, you have colored your cloth the color of uh, ochre, which is the, this ochre is the sign of renunciation. Well, you have colored the cloth, but what a tragedy, O oh yogi, you haven't colored your mind. The mind is still worldly. That should not be. First, most important is the inner renunciation. And another meaning of this yataya is yatana shilaha, Shankaracharya says. Those who are constantly trying. None of that I leave it to God. No. This person would be up and doing if he wanted money, if he wanted uh, power, relationships, Facebook likes. How much up and doing we are to get the things we want. And so if you really honestly desire God, you will be up and doing. Whether it's Vedanta, whether it's meditation, whether it is an austere life, uh, we would be up and doing. And so one of the meanings of the word yati, um, Shankaracharya says, yatana shila, those who are hard at work, those who are constantly making efforts for spiritual realization. Sanyasinaha, Shankaracharya is very clear here, monks. And what are the faults that have been attenuated or thinned out? Kshina krodha di chitta malaha. Their uh, anger and greed and lust and the dirt of the mind has been purified, cleansed. Such people will realize. Realize what? That pure light in the heart, which is their own real nature. All right. So this is the meaning of this particular verse, mantra. One more quickly and then the second one repeats re-emphasizes um, something which was said in this mantra. Fifth mantra, then the sixth mantra re-emphasizes the importance of truth. Importance of truth. Number six. Satyam eva jayate nanritam Satyena pantha vitato devayana Yena akramantya rishayo yapta kama Yatra tat satyasya paramam nidhanam Like a poem to truth, the importance of truth. Truth alone wins and not untruth. But truth is laid the path of the gods by which the desireless seers ascend to where exists the supreme treasure attainable through truth. Inspiring mantra. And here you have it. So this Satya Meva Jayate, every Indian knows it. So this is the national motto of India. After the independence of India, after India became a republic in 1950, when the national emblem, Ashoka Stamba, it was adopted as the national emblem of India. On that emblem, it's written, uh, Satya Meva Jayate, truth alone prevails. And that's taken from this Upanishad. This is the one which has been taken there. So it's the national motto of India. And in fact, all Indian currency, Indian currency bears that Satya Meva Jayate, truth alone prevails. So this Upanishads, they have a lot of, Quotable lines, you know, <laughs> and uh, this is a very famous one. So it comes from this mantra of the Mundak Upanishad. Truth alone prevails, non ritam not untruth. Shankaracharya he, uh, comments here: Prasiddham loke satyavadina anrita vad, uh, vadya abhibhuyate anrita vadya abhibhuyate na viparjaya ata siddham satyasya balavat sadhanatvam. It is well known in the world. That it is the truthful man who overcomes the, the liar, the untruthful man. But I'm glad he thinks it's well known. People seem to doubt it all the time. No, but he says it's, it's well known. The one armed with truth overcomes the liar, the, the untruthful one. And not the other way around, he says. Na viparjaya. And therefore it is established, he says, the um, satyasya balavat sadhanatvam, that truth is the most powerful practice. The most power of all spiritual practices, truth is the most powerful spiritual practice. The effort, the sacrifice, 
it uh, requires to lead a principled life in this world. Um, that is essential for success everywhere, especially in spiritual life. Even if one is not successful in the world, one is indifferent, uh, success is indifferent in terms of money or popularity or politics or whatever it is, one will be successful in spiritual life. And without truth, there's no question of being uh, successful in spiritual life. And then there's a beautiful sentence. Satyena pantha vitato devayana. The path of the gods is laid out with truth. You know, what's the concrete? What's the um, what's the material out of which the path of the gods is, is made? It's made of truth. Satyena pantha vitato devayana. The way of the gods is spread spread out with truth. Who walks on that path? Yena Kramanti Rishayo Hyaptakama. I will come to that. Um, this path of the gods, Devayana, it could just mean the path of spiritual realization. That's in general meaning. But there's a technical meaning. Um, there are these two paths which one takes after death. Um, there's this Pitriyana and Devayana. There is the path of the forefathers. So depending on our past good karma, if one is not a spiritual seeker, depending on our past good karma, we go to one of many heavens, stay there for a long time, come back to this world again, uh, and continue our journey in another human birth. So this is the path of the forefathers. But there's the path of the gods, Devayana, which is those who are spiritual seekers, but who have not attained enlightenment in this life, in this birth, they go by this path, they do not go to any of the lower heavens in order to come back to the world. No, they will not come back. This is called Krama Mukti, sequential liberation. You go from here to the highest heaven, dwell there with God, and attain to full knowledge. So that's the that's the technical meaning of the path of the gods. You can take it either way. Just the Vedantic path leading to enlightenment and freedom, that's the path of the gods. Or this particular meaning of after death, the person who is not yet enlightened will ascend to higher worlds, to, to the highest heaven, from which there is no return through this path of path of the gods. But it's built on truth. What else? Who walks on this? Aptakama. Those whose desires are fulfilled. Not that a person who has ordered everything on uh, Amazon Prime and you know maxed out their credit cards and desires are fulfilled. No, not in that sense. Who have nothing more to look for in this world. Uh, have nothing more. They have, they have understood the limits of um, this human and heavenly pleasures. They are not looking for something limited to satisfy themselves. They are in fact looking for the unlimited. They are looking for, um, they're looking for God. Not for anything worldly. And he gives some qualifications. Kuhaka, Maya, Shatya, Ahankara, Dambha, Anrita, Vajjita. These are some of the qualifications. Those who are free of deceit, multiple words for deceit. Maya, this uh, nature of Illusory, deceiving others, you know, what do you call it? Putting a spin on things, that is kuhaka. Putting a spin on things. Shatya, crookedness. Ahankara, ego. Dambha, uh, arrogance. Anrita, general falsehood. All of this, one has to be cleansed of all of these. Sri Ramakrishna would sometimes send people, he'd say, go and visit Niranjan. See, he would say, see how... Simple he is. And Sri Ramakrishna valued simplicity, Sharolota. The word um, in Indian language for simplicity is the same thing for straight. Sharal means straight and Sharal means simple. So simplicity, straightforwardness. Sri Ramakrishna said, in one's last birth, one becomes simple. We, um, you know, sophisticated society does not, um, does not uh, value simplicity. Because it thinks it's, it seems like a, it's not cool, it's not, it's a lack of uh, sophistication. No, I read this uh, 
quotation somewhere. He says, nothing confounds the clever so much as simplicity. Those who are clever in life, there's one thing that they can't, they can handle other clever people. They can handle stupid people, but they can't handle simple people. Nothing confounds the clever so much as simplicity. Remember, these beings, they are, they are simple, but they are not stupid at all. They are childlike, but they are not childish. And they, in fact, have an intelligence which is profound and deep. In front of them, the rest of us, if we think ourselves worldly, wise and clever, we are more like uh, mischievous grandchildren in, in front of a grandfather or a, or a grandmother who understands us thoroughly and is indulgent with us. We think the child, grandchild thinks that he or she is fooling the grandparent. Of course you are not. <laughs> grandparents knows you thoroughly. <laughs> but uh, it's just indulgent. It's just loving and indulgent and slowly will guide us towards, uh, towards uh, a spiritual realization. So a variety of things, putting a spin on things, um, what we call today fake news, uh, uh, kind of illusoriness, showing what one is not. In fact, psychologists say that the greatest amount of psychic energy we all lose in trying to put up a facade, in trying to show others what we would want them to see us at. It's always a failure and it is exhausting. Then, on this path of the truth, they walk. So the path is truth and yatra satyasya paramam nidhanam. Where, do, where are they walking to? Where lies the greatest of treasures, which is truth itself. So the goal is truth with a capital T, with a capital R, the real, Atman, Brahman, reality itself. And the way to that goal is, is uh, spread out with truth. He says, the treasure, um, satyasya uttama sadhanasya, the best spiritual practice, which is truth. And what is the, uh, it's the means, he says, sadhana is a means. The best means for becoming enlightened is truth. This is the means. And what is the end? Sambandhi sadhyam. The end related to this means the, is paramam prakrishtam nidhanam. It is the greatest treasure of all. Purushartha Rupena. It is present as the goal of human life, the end of all human endeavors, which is moksha, liberation, freedom. Iti nidhanam. Therefore, it is a treasure. It is the greatest of treasures that lies at the end of this path. Yeah. So the path to enlightenment is made of truth, and enlightenment itself is truth. That's the greatest uh, treasure. Yeah.